Hi folks, so in this video I'm going to talk about the category of vulnerability known as structured output generation vulnerabilities. So it's incredibly common in that all of the most, some of the most um, prevalent security vulnerabilities can all be categorized under this umbrella. Essentially anything that's vulnerable to an injection attack uh, is this kind of vulnerability. So it's very common. Uh, it includes cross-site scripting, SQL injection, command injection, and all that uh, LDAF injection, XPath injection. Um, all of those kinds of vulnerabilities are all, uh, you know, can broadly be um, under the umbrella of structured output generation vulnerability. So the problem is that a lot of programs um, generate this structured output, so something that's supposed to match a specific format, um, that's often quite complicated, uh, and then that output then gets processed again differently by some other piece of software. And sometimes multiple times in a row, you know, receive some input, does something to it, passes it on. Next piece of software does something else to it, uh, maybe combines two different things, matches that together and passes it back. And so when the attacker is in control of some of those things that get combined together, uh, if the software developers aren't being very careful, it's easy for it to include, um, like to be vulnerable to injection attacks. So for example, um, a piece of software can build a SQL query because it wants to query something from the database to find something out. Um, and so it uses the information that it has to try and build a SQL query and it sends that to a database. Maybe it needs to run a command and it uses a bunch of different um, variables, different things to build something that it then sends to bash or to the command prompt or to PowerShell and sends that information and actually runs a command. Um, or it's just generating a web page. So you've got a bunch of information um, like what users logged into the website and you know what posts have been made and it uses all that to build some HTML and, and send that to a web browser to, to render on someone's screen. So if there are design or implementation flaws, um, they can result in generating output that doesn't actually match the intended functionality. So what the person who wrote the software is actually trying to achieve. So you know this includes vulnerabilities like SQL injection, command injection, and um, script injection, which includes like cross-site scripting either stored or reflected, so that, you know, w whether or not you're in injecting it into a website that's being accessed, like in that specific moment via a URL, or it's being injected and stored in a database, and then every time someone accesses the website, they get given some script, for example. So all of these are examples. Um, so the, the most common flaw that leads to these security vulnerabilities is when you use string manipulation to actually construct the output um, using some like concatenation or string manipulation. So you're using like the programmer is basically taking a string, combining it with another string, taking something somewhere else, but I mean the user's name, put that in there as well, and uh, you know, user's password or what they've typed into the field, and then we'll you know, create this SQL query, send that to the database. Now, if you've not been really careful about how you're combining that information and being um, careful to kind of sanitize or validate that it includes the information that we're expecting, then what we could be sending to the database is actually something that we're not expecting because that um, user has managed to like inject uh, like things that change the behavior of that SQL code. So um, this, this code actually includes um, at least two vulnerabilities in it. Um, but here's a chance if you want to pause the video and see if you can find the bug in this code uh, before we continue. So I'll give you a second. All right, so there's actually multiple vulnerabilities here. One is this very dangerous get s function, which you may know about. Um, it's basically always going to result in a buffer overflow, so don't do that. Um, but that's not the kind of vulnerability that we are talking about now. Um, it is essentially this, where we're building up using um, sprintf, uh, 
So we're building up a command that then um, gets sent to bash as a command. And the command that's being built is, so basically, uh, uh, okay, I'll step you through each line of this code. So um, we're defining the main function. We're de defining a, a name and a command. And we are asking them what their name is, reading the name from the user. And then we are um, building a string, which is a string called command. Uh, and it has, it says echo, hello. Uh, and then the dollar $s gets replaced with um, the name of the person. So hello, Cliff, semicolon, and then echo. The time is currently, colon, um, semicolon, date. So it's building basically a command that it's going to run at the, at the command line. Now, if the user just types a name, this is going to work as, as, as expected because it's actually going to do, use echo command, which just types to the screen. Hello, Cliff. Semicolon means a new command. And then, and then it, again, it prints to the screen. The time is currently end of that command. And then it runs the date command, so which is a standard Linux command. Um, and so this will work as expected um, if they just run it. However, if what they actually input when it asks what their name is, if instead of just typing in a um, their name, they start typing in bash commands, it is literally going to send this whole string off to um, to bash to to the to system uh, means that it runs in the shell, so in the bash shell. So this is really bad um, because I could just put semicolon, which gives me a new command, um, rm, whatever, like just delete a file, or um, you know, like cat um, the, par the password file, I mean, well, that's not very interesting, and cat some secret file that um, basically that do anything to just get this, it would just run uh, whatever code they enter. So this is obviously a bad thing, and a good example of this kind of vulnerability. So, you know, it's the same way that SQL injection works. So here we're constructing a command that's getting sent to bash. Um, but on a website, we might um, ask the user the name and password, and then we'll create a query that checks whether or not there's someone that has that name and password. And if under the name field, they type in their name, their name, close it with a, you know, inverted comma, and then add dash dash, for example, to start a comment, then um, the query suddenly becomes, is there someone with this name? And the answer will be yes, for example, and then you don't even need to know their password anymore. So um, yeah, it can apply to any kind of programming, um, whether you're talking about web development, like app application or apps, system, you know, whatever. If, you, if you're combining um, inputs that are coming from a user, and doing some string manipulation on them and treating them as though it's, you know, and to generate some kind of output that gets processed, it could be very bad. So instead, what you need to do is make sure that you are um, actually validating and sanitizing that information before you use it. So anything that's coming from an untrusted source. What's an untrusted source? Pretty much everything external to the software. So if, if it's not hard coded into the program, if you're reading a file off the disk, do you trust that file, for example? If you're reading input from a user directly, do you trust that? Um, so the difference between validation and sanitization is validation means that you check that it's in the format that you expect. So you look through it, check it doesn't have anything you don't expect it to have. And then you say, yes, this is correct, or sanitization, which is where you remove the things that are potentially dangerous. So you like apply some formatting or, you know, actually change the content to, um, you know, you're removing formatting, for example, uh, making sure that there's no um, uh, semicolons, for example, in the bash example. But if all I did was remove semicolons, you find some other way because bash has a whole bunch of symbols that are Treated especially like dollar sign, open uh, parenthesis and close parenthesis, 
um, you, or back ticks. There's lots of different ways you can run commands um, in in Bash. So you, you know you, you need to be careful about how you sanitize it. So here's an example of some validation. So if we wanted to add validation to this code, what we can do is basically, so we've, in this example on, on the screen, we've not fixed the underlying problem, the, the buffer overflow problem. So this is still in secure code, but we're, we're fixing the command injection problem. So uh, we can add a validate function. So if it's valid, if the name's valid, um, then, uh, then we'll print it. Otherwise, we won't print it off. So, so that it's basically checking before we use it that um, that it's actually safe to do that. Um, so, valid or not valid is just a one or a zero. And our validate function basically takes our string as input, and uh, there's a for loop um, starting from zero through to the length of the input, and it just checks if any of them um, is not alpha. Um, so it's getting each character, accessing the character at the array element of the point counter. So just go through each. If any of them is not alph alphanumeric or just not an alphabet character, then it just returns it's not valid. So this will just check, is everything just, they're just characters. Anything that's not a character, like a number or a semicolon or a bracket, any of those sorts of things, just will say invalid input instead of running it. So that's one way of securely coding that uh, part of the code. Sanitization is where we fix it to make it safe for use. We remove everything that we don't actively expect it to have um, rather than um, what we um, know we don't want. So we need to think about it in terms of uh, like an allow list or you know whitelist kind of thing. Like these, these are the things that we want to, it to include. And if, if anything else is there, then we won't. We get rid of it, basically. So the, the primary issue here is that when string manipulation is used to generate output um, without making the intent, this, this structure explicit, then all sorts of things can go wrong. Now, there are ways that you can um, use like programming language or um, libraries or framework features to actually build safe queries. So you can use prepare statements, for example, for generating SQL queries that are safe. Um, and it will, you know, you specify these are the variables. Instead of trying to do the string manipulation yourself, you use a function to do that for you and say, these are the variables that we want to query. Uh, and it will safely escape anything that's in there um, so that you won't end up with, um, you know, running code in your SQL database that you don't expect. Similar for, um, there are libraries for building X XML documents, for example, and the, you know, they will escape for you the content that you're trying to put into it. So if there was like an Angular bracket, for example, it will escape that for you so that you don't have to worry about it. And basically, if you're programming, you should make use of um, you know, the library features, use parsers, um, rather than trying to build your own, um, use code that's been carefully built um, that can actually safely use the input uh, and will escape for you the input to generate the expected output. Um, so obviously life can be complicated sometimes and an example of this is HTML uh, because if you're generating HTML code it can include so much stuff so HTML can validly, validly include JavaScript. Um, it can include um, SVG, so that's um, uh, so it's, it's not scalar vector graphic, um, scaled ve ve vector graphics, basically uh, vector graphics. Um, can include um, CSS, so cascading style sheets, um, and all sorts of other things. And so um, it could be quite hard to sanitize that. Um, I mean, it's not impossible, but it can be quite complicated, especially if you are generating a full HTML page that is supposed to include all that stuff. But being careful that when you are basing any of it on user input or untrusted data, that you're very carefully constructing the output to not not include JavaScript that the users managed to trick you into including, because that would obviously be an example of a cross-site scripting vulnerability, an injection attack against a website where a user manages to 
um, get some of their code embedded into your website so that every user that visits it, in terms of a, of a stored cross-site scripting vulnerability, every time any user goes to your website, your that attacker code gets um, rendered into the page or reflected as the same thing, except it's not baked into the database, but it's like reflecting through the URL, for example. Um, so um, I hinted at it earlier, but higher order injection vulnerabilities occur when there are separately processed inputs that get processed separately, and maybe there is even sanitization and validation happening in each of those steps, but then they get combined together in ways that expose a new vulnerability. So that if you've been clever and you can construct these different inputs to a system, um, that you end up uh, being able to inject uh, a thing. Um, and so, you know, it's a complicated picture, um, but that is um, structured output generation vulnerabilities.